When I was a young boy, I worshipped at this church, I grew up in this church, and uh, we had a children's choir, and it was directed by Marion Tanti, uh, and she also directed the adult choir, we called it the Sanctuary Choir, and so I remember uh, very clearly one year that we were going to have the children's choir sing together with the Sanctuary Choir, I don't know if I, how old I was, but I think of myself like 10, 11, 12, something like that. And so, uh, now I'm going to give you this insight into my personality, but I'll tell you what, this uh, sort of, you know, let's, let's just sort of keep this among ourselves. We don't need to be spreading this all over. But here's the kind of person I was and, and am, you know, it's hard to change. So here's one of my greatest flaws. I was sitting out there about halfway back uh, on that side we always sat, and um, I don't know how my mother moved to this side of the sanctuary. I don't think that's right, because we always sat on that side. But putting that aside, so here's the thing. I was sitting there, and I, I was looking at the sanctuary choir. The sanctuary choir used to sing every Sunday, and they would be in their robes, and Mrs. Tanty with her hair and, and directing the choir. And I was thinking, so I said this little prayer. I said, Lord, when we all sing together, give me a solo. And I thought that would be great that me, this little boy, that I could sing this great solo that Mrs. Tanty would hear me and that she would say, oh, Billy T., you should sing this solo. Glorify me was my prayer. Well, of course, that's not such a good thing. You see, I didn't get the solo. Of course not. But I did learn a very important lesson. I learned that the important lesson is not that you get a solo. The important lesson is that you all sing together. The whole point of a choir, if it's a unison song, is that you all sing as one voice, that you don't hear different voices. Or if you're singing in a four-part, that, you know, that each uh, part sounds like one voice. Or like in an orchestra where you would have different musical instruments, that each section sounds like one instrument playing. And that's the power of of the many becoming the power of one. The weakness of the many, the weak voice becomes strong with the one. And so don't sing louder. Sing, don't only sing so loud as you can still hear the person next to you, as Christy would tell us. You know, don't, don't feel like you've got to be the soloist in the choir. Sing with the choir. And that's the lesson that I learned then. Don't glorify me but let us all glorify each other. But what about this then? What about Jesus praying, glorify your son? Well, does that seem right? Now we know this, right? We know that Jesus didn't commit any sin. Jesus was incapable of sin. So then why this prayer? Why is this prayer all right for Jesus to make? If little Billy couldn't say, glorify me, how come Jesus can say, glorify your son? And here is an answer that instructs all of our lives. You see, Jesus didn't just say, glorify your son. He said, glorify your son so that. You need a motive why you want to be glorified. You need a motive why you want the sun to shine on you. You need a motive that the world, when you pray to God, God, glorify what I am doing. Why do you want that to happen? What is your so that? Well, the so that for Jesus was that the Son may glorify you. That is Jesus' purpose on the earth. That the Son 
would glorify the Father. Now we know, as we will celebrate next week, that God comes in three and yet one, and actually we'll get to Trinity Sunday on Father's Day, but we'll get the Holy Spirit next week. So we have the Father, we have the Son, the Holy Spirit, three different and yet all one together. And so Jesus says, I'm going to voluntarily, as Philippians teaches us, I'm going to voluntarily give up all that I have inside of me. It's the, the big word for it is kenosis. It's the emptying out. Jesus says, I'm going to empty out who I am. I'm going to empty out my glory so that you, Father, will be glorified. And that's what Jesus' prayer is. Not a drop of ego in it. It is all about giving glory so that the Father would be glorified. You see, Jesus came with a purpose. Jesus came with a purpose to bring eternal life. It's sort of an unfortunate turn of phrase, the way our English language understands eternal life. Because, you know, as some of us, especially as we get older, we think, well, boy, I wouldn't want to live like another hundred years feeling like this. If eternal life was just living a long time, I don't know that that would be all that would be, you know, we should get all excited about it. Living a, you know, like living to be 200 where your body just continues to deteriorate, that wouldn't be such a big thing. So this life that Jesus comes to bring to us has got to be something other than living a long time. I don't know that I'd want to live just a long time. What's the point? But it's more than quantity, right? Eternal life has to be then more than quantity. It has to be something additional that comes to us, and it comes to us in knowing. Eternal life is to know. Now, I can tell you what something is. I can tell you, for example, I can say, let me help you know what it is to be in the spring sun. I can say, okay, here, when the sun shines and there's not a cloud in the sky, you receive the heat, the warmth of the sun, and if it's a beautiful day, for me, 77 degrees, you might have different degrees. But anyway, you feel the sun. Now, do you know that? Do you know the warmth of the sun? Well, you kind of do. You have a head knowledge of it. But if you really want to know what it is to be in the spring sun, you go outside and you stand there and you let the sun beat down on you. That's to know the warmth of the sun after the world's longest winter, right? That's what it is to know. It's an experience. And that's what the know that Jesus talks about in the Bible is about. Knowing isn't just head knowledge. I can tell you all day long something about what it is to know eternal life. But that's not going to be it. You have to experience it, and that's what we do in worship. And Jesus says, Father, I have come so that my disciples, the small group of people that he had, and now by extension all of the people who worship God in the world, that they would know the one true God. This is eternal life. So, let me ask you, have you experienced the one true God in your life? Have you been at a time when you needed healing in your life, and you can say, I felt God? Have you been at a time when you were lonely, and God said, Here's someone that I'm bringing into your life. That is knowing the presence of God. You see, it's an experience. You've been without a job, and now you have a job. It's an experience of prayer being answered. It is to know the presence of the one true God. This is life that you can know today in part and one day in full. Because we know the one true God and Jesus Christ, he says, and me. Because to know God is to know Jesus Christ. To know Jesus Christ is to know God. Now, you see, that's the whole point of the incarnation. The ascension that we celebrate today is made possible because of Christmas. The whole season of Christmas to Ascension Day is all one. Because it's the incarnation that makes a difference. That's what Christians celebrate. How is Christianity different from other religions? Because we say God became flesh. Your flesh. My flesh. And that flesh 
Jesus didn't say, Heavenly Father, now that it's time for me to come back to you and know my glory, uh, de-incarnate me, take away my flesh. No. We say that Jesus Christ, and this is the gospel truth, stands in his flesh somewhere, heaven, next to the throne of God. Faith doesn't ask questions. In our, uh, in our head, we ask questions. I don't know how. But in our faith, we say that's where he is. So you see, he didn't de-incarnate. The Christ that became incarnate, that took on flesh on Christmas, is the same Christ who in flesh now resides with God in heaven. This is to know God. And so what we know about Jesus Christ from his word is revealing God. Who is Jesus Christ? What do we know about Jesus Christ? He healed some people. He prayed for people. He came to bring life. Do you want to know what God is like? That's God. What is God like? God is a God who is love. Do you see that the God that we worship is not some God thundering down lightning bolts to make your life miserable? God is a God who brings a helping hand to carry you from the hospital to the recovery room. God is a God who says, you need someone else in your life, here is that someone. God is a God who says, I will help you where you see that there can be no more help. That's where I'm going to come. That is God, because that's what Jesus Christ did. All the stories that you've heard these last couple of months of, of Lazarus, of the woman at the well, all of those stories, can you pull all of those back in your mind and remember that's who Jesus is? So Jesus says, okay, God, the hour has come. I'm going to go to the crucifixion. I'm going to rise, and it's going to be Easter, and then I'm going to ascend 40 days later. It's all about to happen. We're right there, God. We're right there, Father. He calls him Abba, Daddy, Daddy, I'm about to come home. And he says, but now look, here's the thing. You gave me all these people. You gave me these disciples I've worked with. You gave me these, these people who on June 1, 2014 are worshiping at Hope Church. You gave me these people. Now you've got to take care of them for me because I'm not going to be there. So will you protect them? Will you protect them, Father, so that? Why? Why does Jesus want you protected? So that you may be one. You look at the church today, you say, man, I guess Jesus' prayer didn't get answered, did it? Well, maybe we misunderstand the meaning of one. Maybe we misunderstand what it means to be one if we think we all have to be the same. Just like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct personalities and yet one. So we are distinct personalities and yet one. That we may be one as they, as the Father, Son, and Spirit are one. Now, when you're going through this life, you might feel like you're swimming through the ocean, right? Just one little fish. Well, if you're one little fish, you're probably going to get eaten by the shark. But if you stay together, if you swim through the harsh waters of life together, you have the power of one. The many become one. You have the power to send away the threat that come to our lives. You know what this is, right? Who, who is this, the little blue bird? All right, fish. <laughs> who's, a, who's that little blue fish? You guys know, right? Nemo? Dory. Oh, that's Dory. Looking for Nemo. Finding Nemo. Right? Okay. I don't know what those... So anyway, the point of this story is they're looking for Nemo. But they all look together. They swim through the currents together. That's sort of what, like, the church is about, finding Nemo, finding you. God says, Jesus, go find you. Go find Bill. Go find all of those people and bring them safely home. 
You see, when you swim together, you have that power. Now, my grand, one of my grandsons said to me one day, Grandpa, why do zebras have stripes? I don't know. I thought this was like some you know, knock-knock joke or something. But it's not a joke. It's a real thing. I said, I have no idea why zebras have stripes. I must have missed that day in school. He said, well, zebras have stripes for a very important reason. You see, when it's just the zebra by itself being chased by the lion, it's not going to turn out too good for the zebra. Circle of life, okay, I get all of that. But my point is, if you're all by yourself, his point was, you don't have strength. But when you all stand together, all those zebras together, it's hard to tell one from the other. You certainly can't tell who the little one is, who the weak one is. And so the lion, the predator, doesn't know who to go after. It's only when they get separated from the pack that they become subjected to danger. And Jesus knows that when he leaves this world, Satan remains behind, the evil one remains behind, that the world that wanted to put Jesus to death still wants to put to death the faith of Christ that is in you. Stay together. Stay together and fight against the power of evil, for there is strength. They're all different. You're all different. We're all different. But we have power in one. And so, as we think about flying through this life, you can be that solitary goose flying away. You're not going to get very far because the headwinds will be too strong. So God sends us this beautiful image of the geese flying together. And of course, what do they do? They take turns at the front, right? Today it might be my turn. Tomorrow it might be your turn. This is my job what I do here. This is what you've hired me to do. But I only can do this for so long. I can only be at the front of the pack, then I got to go to the back and I got to fly in formation with the rest of you. And, and some of you, some of you who head up Kids Hope USA, you got to be out in front sometimes. I can't do that. Those of you in charge of keeping the property beautiful, you got to do that. I can't do that. I can't be in front on that. Those of you in charge of children in worship, those of you in charge of the First Hope community meal, those in charge of ushering, I can't do that. I can't be getting uh, you know, ready for worship and ushering here. You've got to do that. You've got to take the lead. And so that's how we become one. We're many, and yet we become one in our word. In the word that we preach, we're one. In our witness to the world, we become one. And that is the power of many becoming one. So these are the things that Jesus prays. These are the things that Jesus prays would happen to his church. I think about the church a lot. That's also what you pay me to do. I think about how just in our little block we have, you know, Methodists and Lutherans and Episcopalians and uh, other, another denomination over here. Well, what, why? Why? I don't know why. But maybe in God's wisdom, knowing that we all need different expressions of our faith, maybe that's a good thing. One writer I read this week said, you know, maybe unity is kind of like a dance. We're all dancing a different dance, some of us not very well, some of us better. But we're in this dance, and maybe... Maybe we're all dancing a little differently, but we're all dancing together on the floor. We're all engaged in this beautiful dance of life in which we're held together by a common goal. To dance beautifully, apart, but together. You see, we live not for our own glory. What's the beauty of that picture is all of the different colors, right? The beauty of that picture is all of the couples and their different expressions caught at the same time. We're not the same, thankfully, right? I mean, how many, 
little billies do we need who want to sing solos with the choir when they're 10 years old? We don't need a lot of them. But don't tell me you don't have your own little faults. I know you do. I know you do. But that's all right. Because God's going to say, all right, forget about that, but let's find a positive use for that flaw. Let's fix that flaw and turning it into something positive. Because that's what God calls us to be. God calls us to be people engaged in this, in this journey for the church that Jesus has left behind. Our purpose as a church is to glorify God. Our purpose as a church is not to get bigger. That's like a byproduct. That's what happens if the church glorifies God. Because the essence of the church, one, one writer says, is that the church would glorify God. If we are not glorifying God, if the focus is on me, if the focus is on us, then we aren't accomplishing the goal. If the focus is on, is God glorified? That should be the question that I have to answer in my heart, in my mind, you in your heart, the praise team, Mitch, Christy, the praise band, everybody, we should, the media team, we should all have to answer, have we glorified God today? As we leave those doors, have we glorified God? If we haven't, then we have not yet accomplished the goal for which we have been called. Our goal isn't to get bigger. Our goal is to glorify God more. And then God will bless us as he sees fit with abundance as well. Our oneness, you see, has a purpose to share the light of Jesus in a dark world. <clears throat> I'm going to invite the consistory to come forward with their candles. I'm going to invite the praise team to come forward with their candles right now. You see, on the seventh Sunday of Easter, we put out this candle. Come on up. <clears throat> and while I'm talking, I'd like you to put your candle in the Christ candle, and then I want you to start, go find a row, go find a row, and uh, spread throughout the church. Can somebody from the balcony come down with their candle and uh, spread the light up there? Come on down. If you don't have candles, you're going to have to come and get a candle. If you didn't get one when you came in. You see, the point of this is, and now start spreading the light, start spreading the light, start spreading the light. How will... How will the world know that Jesus Christ lives? How will the world know that Christ is still present in this world? Because we're going to put out that candle in just a minute. We're going to end the season of Easter in just a minute. But Easter ends with the ascension. And as we will celebrate next week, then the Holy Spirit comes. But the Holy Spirit comes to inspire people, to inspire the people who are many, who are one. Christy, if you would start playing our song. We're not going to sing yet. We're going to go to that in a minute. But I want you to listen to this melody and think about this melody. You see, the power of that Seen from enough distance is a powerful light. The ascended Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. His candle appears to be out unless you look at the light that makes us one. Shall we rise, if you are able, raise your candle to the ascended Christ, and we sing together.
As you depart, you may put out the candle and we'll receive them in the rear of the church as you depart today. My friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. So God says, you shall put my name on my people and I will bless them. Friends, accept God's love. Be confident in your faith and hope and carry the light of the ascended Christ to the world. And they'll know you are Christian by your love. Amen.